Hello, I'm David Baltimore, Pre Professor of Biology at the California Institute of Technology, uh, and I'm going to talk more about HIV. Um, in particular, uh, I want to develop the idea that gene therapy may be a reasonable tool for attacking HIV. And I'm going to do that in the context of why standard approaches to HIV have not worked and why something as heroic as gene therapy may in fact be the only way to go. So uh, let me talk about the more general issue of why you would take a sort of molecular biologist's approach or a molecular engineer's approach to an infectious disease. For most infectious diseases, you, you don't need anything like that. Most infectious diseases uh, are handled by standard methodologies, drugs, uh, antibiotics, vaccines to prevent them. Uh, but certain infectious agents, HIV, malaria, tuberculosis, and others, are unsolved medical problems, are great needs today because they have proven extremely difficult. They will not respond to the standard methodologies. Uh, take vaccines, which are the right way to deal with infectious agents. That is, prevention is better than treatment. Uh, how, do, how do vaccines work? They work by inducing antibodies or what are called protective T cells. And those cells then, and the, and the antibodies, attack a virus if it comes into your body. So you're pre-prepared for a virus. And what they're doing is taking advantage of the immune system, which would respond to that virus anyway, but would respond more slowly, uh, doesn't remember having seen it before, and so has to learn all about it de novo. And so what the vaccine really is doing is short-circuiting the recognition of the virus, getting rid of the learning stages so that the body can go right in and handle it. But you have to have good antibodies or good T cells to do this. And, and I'm even going to ignore T cells for the moment because antibodies seem to be the major thing that vaccines elicit. So if the organism itself, and that's true of tuberculosis and others, cannot elicit good, broadly neutralizing, reproducible antibodies, then vaccines aren't going to work. And that's the situation. So how do these kinds of agents elude antibodies? Well, what HIV does, and we'll go into this more in a little bit, is it hides its jewels in uh, coatings and in structures uh, so that antibodies just can't find the relevant parts of the virus. Malaria and other agents like it vary their structure continually. So even though you get a good antibody, by the time the antibody is being made, the organism has changed its stripes and now is no longer sensitive to that antibody. Tuberculosis, on the other hand, sort of becomes latent. It goes and hides itself away um, and takes advantage, actually, of immune deficiencies to come back out and cause uh, transmissible disease. And there are other tricks that viruses and other organisms use, like direct immunoinhibition, inhibiting the immune system using viral proteins. Now, viruses like polio and measles and mumps lulled us into complacence because we could easily make vaccines. And I remember the day that the then Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare came before the nation and said, we have discovered HIV and we should have a vaccine in no time. Well, she was right in that we had made vaccines against lots of other agents. She was wrong. HIV is different than polio or measles or mumps. And you can see the consequence of that, dif dis that difference here where we look at the spread of HIV through the world. So HIV almost certainly first appeared uh, in Africa. Uh, and it's, these red areas are the areas where it's highly uh, endemic, where, where many people are infected with it. Uh, that then spread uh, over 
to the United States, spread to Europe, spread ultimately to South America, and is now spreading more and more through Asia, tremendous problems in Russia, in India. Uh, as, as I said before, the numbers in, in China are still low, but we worry about them getting larger. And in fact, basically, the whole world suffers from this problem. What are we going to do about it? How are we going to put the genie back in the box? Well, drugs, small molecules that, that target key parts of the virus, they target the reverse transcriptase, they target the integrase, they target the protease, all of those things that, that I showed you are inside the virus are targets for these drugs. Drugs have been very successful in the developed world. And many people are today living with HIV infection who would have died uh, five years ago, uh, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, if they had been uh, infected with the virus. Uh, and those drugs are terrific. They're hard to take. They're, they have side effects. They're not perfect, but they've made a huge difference in the life of infected people. But they're expensive, and so only recently has the world come together and said, we're going to find ways to make these drugs available in the less developed world. And so now the drugs are, develop, are available in Africa and elsewhere, uh, but still, they're relatively expensive even for those circumstances, and they, are, um, and they have their, their side effects and, and are not perfect. What you really want to do is to prevent the spread of the virus not treat the infected people. So one way to do that is education. We know how the virus is transmitted. It's transmitted sexually, mainly. It's transmitted through contaminated blood. Um, and so we can, we can give people advice. We can educate people about how to prevent the spread of the virus. And that has been effective. Rates of transmission went way down in Uganda and Thailand uh, after very explicit, very widespread educational programs. But if we just look at the United States, we have young people coming along into a gay lifestyle, uh, in particular in the United States, who are continuing to get infected. And so vigilance is something that has to be maintained continually if education is going to be the mode of uh, preventing spread. So what other response is possible? Well, the right response is a vaccine. If we could get people to be in an immune state to the virus, then it wouldn't matter if they were exposed or not. But HIV is not controlled by our immune systems when we get an infection. And so making a vaccine that's able to do what the ordinary virus can't do is a really daunting problem. And people have worked on it now for quite a while. They've tried to make proteins that would elicit antibodies that would bind to the virus. They've tried to stimulate T cells. We are seeing progress, particularly on the T cell front, we're seeing significant progress. But it's slow, and it is unclear that any direction that we're taking today is going to get us to a vaccine. Now, let me spend just a minute on why HIV is so resistant to antibody, because all other viruses, except, uh, yeah, basically almost all other viruses, are sensitive. So antibodies have to attack a virus on the outside. They have to attack these, these spikes on the outside of the virus uh, and cover them up or trigger them or get rid of them, do something that will make it impossible for the virus to bind to an infected cell. And the spike is made of two components. It's made of a head, which is called GB120. You can see that down here very well. Uh, and it has a, a spike that goes into the membrane, which you can see over here uh, very well. And uh, that spike is known as GP41. So we have GP120 on the surface, GP41 on the spike. And there are antibodies known, human antibodies, monoclonal antibodies, that will bind both to the head and to the spike and prevent infection. 
Problem is that those antibodies do not have a high enough affinity to provide protection to people. And furthermore, uh, you can't elicit those antibodies from the human immune system with any degree of reproducibility. They appeared once, we have captured them, but we can't do it over and over again. So the monoclonal antibodies are not the answer. But let's look at how HIV actually goes into a cell. So here is an HIV particle. And here's one spike blown up and to be very large. It actually has three balls on it, two in the front, one behind that can't be seen. And, uh, and so it's a trimer. It has this, this spike that goes into the membrane, which is GP41, which is also a trimer. In fact, there's one monomer each of 41 and 120 in complex uh, that, are, that were separated by a protease. This is the infected cell down here. That cell has a molecule called CD4 on its surface. Only cells that have CD4 on their surface are infected by HIV because the first thing that HIV does is interact with CD4 by a place on the, on the GP20 molecule. That interaction causes a whole wholesale change in the structure of this trimer. And what it does is to generate down here a binding site for another protein, which is called the co-receptor, CCR5. The virus, after a CD4 is bound, now develops a CCR5 binding site, binds there. The fusion actually occurs there between the membrane up here on the virus and the membrane on the cell. You can see the extent to which the CD4 molecule changes the structure of the protein. This is at rest. This is HIV at rest uh, outside of cells, and this is the structure of one of those three monomers. And you can just see there are ribbons in it. It's, all you need to do is look at it impressionistically. Now CD4 binds to it. CD4 binds over here. You can see CD4 binding. And now look at the change in the structure of this protein. This helix is over here. It used to be over there. Uh, the, there's a wholesale reorganization. The consequence of that can be seen best in this model. So here is the at rest state. This is the binding site for CCR5. It's in two pieces. It isn't actually put together. Only when CD4 binds does it come together. This is the binding site for CD4. It's in pieces. Only when CD4 is in the environment does it induce a change in structure that puts together the elements of the CD4 binding site. And then, uh, this is perhaps best seen on the previous slide, uh, there's also all of this stuff around here. And what that stuff is, and you can see this is looking down on the virus, you see it all around the outside. That stuff is sugar, carbohydrate. And that prevents antibodies from binding. So the antibodies can't bind all around. The only place they could possibly bind would be the CD4 binding site or the CCR5 binding site. And neither one of those exist in the resting state. They're both in spl split into pieces. And so making an antibody that will uh, neutralize this virus is extremely difficult. The only hope I think that we have is not trying to make the human immune system do something it can't do, but rather to use the intelligence of modern molecular biologists and structural biologists who can look at these structures and say, well, I see a different place. <coughs> Excuse me. I see a different place where we might attack it. Or maybe we can attack it not with a standard antibody, but with some different kind of protein or some modified antibody that can get into a crevice which a standard antibody can't get into because antibodies are actually quite big on the scale of these molecules. So what has been the response by the scientific community? Well, either people have just bulled ahead and said, I don't care about the arguments, we're going to see if we can't induce antibodies. And that's pretty well been given up by now because it has failed in so many people's hands who've tried so many different ways. And so people have moved to T cells, which 
as I said, are rarely involved in, in vaccines, but maybe occasionally. And you can expect that there will be partial control of certain viral infections by using T cells. And the way you stimulate T cells is not with proteins, it's with little peptides. And some people have tried to use peptides. They've used DNA to try to encode viral proteins or peptides and try to make novel kinds of vaccines. Well, this is all new technology. Nobody's ever done it before. And although there are hopeful results, uh, it's going very slowly. And we really don't know, even if we could make a good peptide-based, DNA-based, virus-based vaccine, if that would be of any use to anybody. So we in my own laboratory have taken a different approach. We've said, let's assume that you're never going to elicit an antibody from humans that's going to be effective. Let's assume that T cells may be good, but they're not going to do the total job. They're not going to provide protection that we need. Is there another way to go about this? Well, I said, gave you part of the answer already. That is that there are uh, techniques that we have for designing antibodies or antibody-like molecules that should be able to attack the virus. So let's do that. But if we do that, we have to give up our, all of our standard methodology because we can never elicit that from the body since the body has never seen it, never made it, doesn't know how to do it. Um, so we're going to have to direct the immune system to make the thing that we've designed. And that's where gene therapy comes in. Because with gene therapy, we can put genes into the immune system. Those genes now can encode kinds of molecules that the immune system doesn't ordinarily make. We've also taken a separate approach. So that's one approach. Uh, and that is to use something called RNAi. RNAi is an interfering RNA. It directs the cell to degrade messenger RNAs. So let's say we targeted an RNAi to the receptor for HIV, to CCR5. Now, if we could get that into a cell by gene therapy again, then we could protect that cell so it couldn't be infected by HIV. So these are two, and there are others, but these are two methods that we're actually trying. And I'll tell you about the RNAi approach now, and in the third segment of this lecture, I'll develop the ideas around uh, the other approach. All right, but there are a number of things that any sort of gene therapy approach will have in common. First of all, that the gene therapy has to be directed to blood stem cells. All right, gene therapy is an old idea. Uh, and it's been tried in many different contexts, in particular for rare inherited immune defects, and it works. But it is not standard therapy because it has side effect problems that, that have held it from being uh, adopted as a, as a standard therapy. So what we want to do is to get rid of some of those problems by actually using HIV itself, which in a funny way is a safe virus for gene therapy, and to bring therapeutically useful HIV derivatives into the body. Now, the stem cells are the ones that we want to infect. These are not the kinds of embryonic stem cells that have been discussed uh, widely as, as new therapies for, for developmental and genetic diseases, but rather uh, stem cells that solely give rise to blood and stem cells that are found in the bone marrow. Now, I'm talking about using a virus in a positive way using a virus that can do gene therapy. Um, the, uh, this would be only the second case in history of viruses doing something useful. Viruses are this enormous kingdom of, of agents, uh, but they never do anything positive for us. Uh, they do mainly negative things. Uh, they cause colds and they cause polio and whatever. But they do one positive thing, and that is that they cause these wonderful variegations in the surface of carnations or tulips. 
And uh, in particular, in tulips, uh, they caused something called tulip mania, uh, which was a time in Holland when people were spending as much for a single tulip bulb uh, as they were for a house. And that tulip bulb was actually infected uh, by a virus, and it was the virus causing the lovely variegations that people were spending all this money for. But we, as scientists, can do something else useful with viruses, and that is gene therapy. And the reason for that is pretty straightforward. I told you, retroviruses integrate their genetic material as a DNA copy into the genetic material of cells that they infect. But they do not kill those cells. And so they're natural carriers of genes. That's, in fact, what a tumor virus, a cancer-inducing virus, does. It carries a gene into the cell. That gene now takes over the growth of that cell. Well, we don't want to do that. We want to bring in genes which will have therapeutic value. Um, but that's a matter of getting into the lab, engineering these viruses so they're no longer dangerous, only do good things, can't do bad things. Um, and uh, that is, in fact, what we're about. Now, I keep talking about hematopoietic stem cells or, or blood stem cells. Uh, let me make that point explicit. There is in our bone marrow something called the hematopoietic stem cell, HSC. That cell, when it divides, either gives rise to more of itself or it gives rise to either the common lymphoid progenitor or the common myeloid progenitor. Those, in turn, give rise to other cells, and those, in turn, give rise to all of the cells of the blood. So red blood cells, platelets, those little things that help you uh, 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 coagulate the blood, granulocytes that fight off infection, monocytes that fight off infection, and B cells and T cells, which are the two kinds of lymphocytes that make B cells make antibodies, T cells uh, kill cells directly. So all of those cells actually derive from this cell. If we can modify the genetic properties of this cell, it will be maintained because it's self-renewing in, in the bone marrow, and it will give rise to uh, all of the blood elements. In particular, we can sneak in this way new kinds of T cell receptors and new kinds of antibodies, or sneak in a protective molecule like an RNAi. All right, so let's focus on the RNAi concept. We're focusing on CCR5, the co-receptor for HIV. Why is that a good target? It's a cellular gene. Don't we need it? If you knock it out, won't we lose important function? Well, it happens that there is a natural population of people who carry two mutant copies of the gene for CCR5 and can't make any CCR5. So the, their cells have no CCR5 on their surface. Those people are actually resistant to HIV infection because H CCR5 is an absolute requirement for HIV infection. But amazingly, they have virtually no other immune defects. They may have defects in relation to one or another specific organism, but to a first approximation, people live a normal life without this gene. So if we can knock down this gene in the cells of an HIV-infected person, those cells will now be able to grow up and replace helper T cell function. Now, some people carry one mutant gene and one normal gene. Those people make somewhat less than 50% of the normal amount of CCR5, and they develop AIDS much more slowly than normal people do. And so uh, we know that even if we could just knock it down 50 or 60%, we could actually affect the course of the disease. If we can knock it down 95%, we can probably have a major effect. So what we're trying to do is to bring into helper T cells an interfering RNA. It's called an RNAi or an siRNA or an shRNA variously, uh, which is able to block the translation of the messenger RNA for CCR5 or cause degradation of the messenger RNA for CCR5. And thus, it'll act like that mutation and protect those cells and those people. How do you do that? Well, this is a vector based on HIV. But if you 
knew what all these abbreviations meant, and I won't go into them, what you would see is there's very little HIV left here. All of this is stuff we put in there. We've left just the bones of HIV because those bones help the mechanics of this virus work. And in particular, we have put in here this little cassette, which encodes an RNAi. RNAi is an RNA that has two strands that are complementary to each other. That's what these two arrows are. They're held together in here by a loop, but the loop has to be gotten rid of. So when this goes into a cell, it is transcribed. You get this little hairpin of RNA. All right, it's got one strand here, the other strand here, and the little loop over here. There's a protein in our cells called dicer that recognizes these loops and cuts them out. So now we have just the two little strands, about 20 odd nucleotides long. They get piled into something called the risk complex with a bunch of proteins. And only one strand of these two strands ends up in risk. Risk on the, with, with the RNA, and it goes around looking for other, R, other RNAs that have the complement of this sequence. And they find them in messenger RNAs. They bind to those messenger RNAs and either cause them to be degraded or cause them to stop translation. So we can specifically target CCR5 and, in principle, nothing else in the cell with this methodology. Does it work? Yes, it does work. I don't want to go into uh, the uh, details here, but if you look over here at this black line, this is the amount of CCR5 uh, in normal cells. Uh, this is no CCR5 at all, so you can see that a lot of cells have CCR5. This is if you put in a very good RNAi. All those cells have gone away. There's just a little bit left down here. So when we quantitate this kind of thing, we can see that uh, we've gotten rid of most of the CCR5. Uh, and now we want to infect these cells with HIV and see if they're resistant. And so we go in with an HIV here uh, that, um, sorry, we go in with an HIV here uh, that tests whether these cells uh, are no longer infectable. And this is the kind of data that you get. I, I won't go, again go through the details of it, but uh, if ordinarily 50% of the cells have CCR5, now only 3.4% have it. Uh, and if ordinarily you infect 7% of the cells, now you infect 2% of the cells. These, in fact, were our early attempts to do this. We can now get much higher protection than this. And we are actually taking this into human beings, uh, trying to do phase one trials as we speak. So our conclusions are that you can make a vector based on HIV. HIV is actually called a lentivirus, so these are called lentiviral vectors. It can deliver an siRNA, which is specific to CCR5, two primary peripheral blood lymphocytes. We've proven that. And those, that was the data I was showing you. We haven't shown we can do this in bone marrow, but we believe we should be able to. We can get reductions in the range of tenfold of CCR5. That's a lot more than we already know is, is at least partially protective. Uh, we can show that the inhibition is quite specific. I didn't mention that. Uh, we can get now roughly five-fold reductions in the number of infected cells. Uh, that's a lot. It means there are a lot of protected cells around. Uh, and, uh, and there's another virus that doesn't use this receptor, which is unaffected by it. So we're, we have the conditions for, for doing well. We've gotten better at making these siRNAs, uh, better about uh, delivering them. Uh, the only thing left is to see if we can actually do this in human beings, uh, and we're trying to do that. Uh, so what will it take to make this a real therapy? First of all, as I said, we need to optimize the inhibition of HIV growth, and that we've done. We need to organize a clinical trial for something like this, which is an agent that's never been tried before. This is a complicated process 
that requires all sorts of regulatory approvals. But we're in the process of forming a company that will do that, and we hope to see progress in the near future. Thank you.